Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you have been told a lie. You have been told that the alto clarinet is a bad instrument by certain band directors, I'm sure. Raise your hand if you have ever heard somebody say something bad about the alto clarinet. Oh, wow, look, like 70% of the room. How many of you yourself have said something bad about the alto clarinet? Raise your hand. Oh, look, like 20% of the room, 30%. Liars! There's no such thing as a bad instrument, only... Okay, yeah, there are some bad instruments. Um, but it's not the instrument's fault. Most of it lies in... A lot of times it's the band director's fault. So my name is Brett Mitten. I am a composer, orchestrator, and author. And joining me today is Matthew Banks. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Matthew. My name is Matthew Banks. I am a performer, an arranger, an unabashed advocate for the E flat alto clarinet. <laughs> All right, so you have a handout here. We're going to talk about some of the things on the handout. We're also going to try and go as fast as possible because we only have 30 minutes to cover the entire history, use, and scoring of this instrument here. So, first things first, we're going to do a blind tape, a uh, blind sample. You'll notice that I have a screen here. You'll also notice that Brett does not own an iron. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Matt is going to go back there, and he's going to play a piece called Lincolnshire Posey. How many of you have heard of Lincolnshire Posey before? All right, good sample. For the young kids in here, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, this is not a piece you're, you play yet. Hopefully you will, because it is one of the greatest pieces of wind band literature out there. It has a really significant alto clarinet part. Now, here's the problem. Granger knew that the alto clarinet may or may not be there, so he cued it in another instrument. Matt's going to play it first on one instrument. Matt, take it away. the sound instrument B. Matt, why don't you come out here and tell us which one you used. So, for the first one, I used this bass clarinet. For the second one, I used my E-flat alto clarinet. Now, it seemed to be mostly split down the middle, which you prefer. Could you hear a difference between the two? Yes. yes, you could hear a difference. Well, one of the things is, which instrument was it written for? Well, it was written for the alto clarinet. It's actually a lot easier to play on the alto clarinet than it is on the bass clarinet because it puts it in a much nicer register. On the bass clarinet, it's all this crossing over the break stuff, which I know you, know, you clarinet players uh, don't like. Uh, by the way, Matt's going to do all the playing. I'm not. Uh, 
teaching a little secret for some reason. Somebody who doesn't play clarinet into a clarinet thing. <laughs> so, so the alto clarinet was the second one, and it's the instrument that the composer Percy Granger preferred. In fact, we have a letter from Granger from the premier performance of War saying he really wanted six alto clarinets to be performing the ensemble, as well as six bass clarinets. He, he absolutely wanted the instrument there. So we kind of have to go with what the composer said. How many of you have ever seen six at once? Two people? Yeah. I don't even think I've ever seen six at once. It's kind of rare. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of the alto clarinet. Clarinets in larger sizes tended to be more difficult to make because you have to have bigger and bigger tools. So the first clarinets that got made that were bigger than our standard A or B flat clarinet were actually in the key of G. This was the original alto clarinet. How many of you have ever seen a clarinet in the key of G before? Anybody have a B flat clarinet out? We don't actually have one on stage. So the G clarinet is quite a bit longer. Notice this one doesn't have a mouthpiece, and so it'd be even longer still. Thank you so much. This is the instrument that Mozart actually originally scored the concerto for. He never finished that scoring and changed it over to a clarinet A. Uh, Johann Christoph Bach also used this instrument a little bit. It's also really popular in Turkey. Uh, Matt, play a little bit of Mozart on the G. It's a little brighter. It's a little darker than your B-flat clarinet. You'll also notice that the keys look really different. This is a different fingering system than we use here in the United States. Now, as manufacturers got a little bit better, they would make an instrument called a basset horn that's in F. So a little bit bigger than this, except you see this bass clarinet here? How it, yeah, it looks really long. How many of you have seen bass clarinets that look a lot shorter? Well, this bass clarinet has a keyword all the way to low C. Really deep note. That is designed after the old basset horn, which is an early form of the alto clarinet. And so that instrument would go down quite a ways, and it turns out that was probably Mozart's absolute favorite instrument in his latter years. He, some of his last pieces he wrote, even as he was on his deathbed, were for basset horn. And then, a few decades later, we get this instrument, the alto clarinet in E flat. This was the instrument that was used by bands. How many of you have ever seen one of these in your band? Only a couple of people. It's kind of sad. It's a really important voice. Matt, why don't you go ahead and play a little excerpt for us, and then we will talk a little bit about why you don't see it very much. So, this is one of my favorite excerpts to illustrate because... It's very famous and very well hidden. In Granger's piece, Molly on the Shore, you know, the entrance is in the first clarinet, but also in the E flat alto clarinet. So, 
see, even 70 years ago, there were band directors out there saying, we don't need that instrument in our band. We can just get rid of it. And if there's an important part, we'll just cue it in another instrument. We'll put it in the third clarinet or the bass clarinet or the alto sax. It's fine. We don't need that sound. Except for, take a look at your hand down. There's a section on there that it starts on the second page. Essential band works for the alto clarinet. And pretty substantial list. And these pieces are by composers who are really well known. Percy Granger, which we play a couple pieces. Well, Matt played my house. You don't want to hear me play. Ingo Dahl, Vittorio Giannini, Paul Hindemith, uh, Arnold Schoenberg, Norman Del Joyo, Chris Kenny, Carell Puso, Rob Nelson, Alfred Reed, uh, Johann Demain. Uh, these are all really important works of band literature that call for the alto clarinet. And the part is essential in those pieces. Yet, a lot of times band directors just say, we don't need it. We'll just have someone else cover it. Why do they say we don't need it? There's a couple reasons. One is a lot of times the instruments have been sitting unused for years in the instrument storage room. How many of you have a band hall where you don't know what hall is in the instrument room? There is stuff back there that no one has looked at for years. Yeah, I mean, I was in college, we had an instrument back there that no one had gotten out to play in over 40 years until I got there and I got my hands on and I was like, oh, this is fun. But, the instruments, if they sit around not used, they start to go bad and they need some repair work done. So, one, the instruments aren't always in the greatest shape. Two, how many of you spent time actually practicing one of these sizes of clarinet that's not the B flat? Very, very few of you have spent time working on a non B flat clarinet or a non A clarinet. Well, guess what? You need to put in a little bit of time. And if one of these pieces comes up on a band program, you can put the time in to learn a new instrument. Now, the band director probably doesn't allow it. Matt, you have much more experience in this than I. You, you being the clarinetist, what's your experience um, you know, having to get an old instrument out of storage? So, I have a great anecdote. When I first got to college at a tiny institution in Indiana, the first piece on our program was Lincolnshire Posey. And I was instructed as the freshman of the section to play the alto clarinet. The alto clarinet that was issued to me was an old Bundy. Do any of you know what Bundys are? Yeah, I, I heard the internal shiver from all the uh, old folks in the back. Absolutely <laughs> awful instrument. Um, okay. Caveat on that, there's one good Bundy instrument out there, and it is their Contra Alto. They, that's actually a really good instrument, and I know lots of professionals who use that one. Now, Otherwise. Now, the Bundy I started on had open tone holes instead of uh, key rings, so it was naturally out of tune with itself. Most of its pads were leaking. As best as I can tell, the instrument had last been serviced probably during the Vietnam War. Um, <laughs> And I started on a very bad mouthpiece, the mouthpiece that came with it, which had a series of interesting growths inside of it that I had to scrub off. Needless Take to say, your science classroom, find out. <laughs> needless to say, not the best introduction to the instrument. Well, I think that's a, a good segue, though, into how to keep it up. One, take the instrument as soon as you get it to a repair shop. Somebody like uh, Tony in the next room over, he's a great repair tech, he's who I take my instruments to when I can't fix it myself, and they will get the instrument actually working, because the bigger the clarinet, the harder it is to keep an adjustment. There's more parts on it, because the keys get longer and longer and have to do more things. So it takes a little bit more work. Pads will wear out, especially just over time. If it's sat in an instrument room, it may need a whole set of patents. That's, that can get costly. And there are some things you can do to help it. This is my personal alto clarinet. Notice I have a peg put on here. 
Matt has a, an Apple player, the exact same brand, probably within a few years of each other being made. I put this peg on myself because I know how to do a lot of instrument repair. Matt does not have it. The peg, man, it helps. Because it's a heavier instrument, to be able to just have it sit on the floor and not on your right hand, that really helps. And notice this one has one as well. This is a, a newer <coughs> instrument than these. These are from the, the 60s. Uh, the mouthpieces. So critical, and we have a lot of different mouthpieces here. So I'm going to let Matt talk about mouthpieces. So mouthpieces, in my opinion, feel free to contradict me if you know more about the clarinet, which a lot of people do. Mouthpieces are, for me, the most indispensable part of the instrument itself. A great mouthpiece can transform a terrible form into a functional one. In the same way, a great mouthpiece can enhance a great instrument and a great player. I've already talked at length about how the Bundy mouthpiece was rather terrible. A Bundy mouthpiece. And I was thinking about throwing it <laughs> Now, through my own experience and misuse of my disposable income, I've been exposed to most of the professional alto clarinet mouthpieces offered. The one I recommend most for my students, and uh, my student Landon uses it for his alto right here, is the David Height alto clarinet mouthpiece. It costs a total of about 75 bucks, it takes alto saxophone reeds, and it is a revelation in free-blowing response across all of the registers. The next one up the list, the one that I used the most, you know, until I turned to the dark side, is the B44. Initially, my B44 is not as good as my height mouthpiece until I enhanced it with a silver optimum ligature. By, by the way, B44 by Van Doren. So just in case you're looking at brand, and it, it should be on the handout there. As is the optimum. Now the challenge with this setup is it's about twice the cost of the height. The mouthpiece itself is like 120 or something like that, and the optimum ligature is about $60. Nearly twice, well no, more than twice the price of the height. Then we arrive, I'm also circumventing Yamaha mouthpieces, I have some experience with Yamaha 4Cs. They are excellent beginner mouthpieces, not so much suited to uh, professional work, don't sue me. Um, now we arrive at my own modern setup. This is a Pomerico Crystal mouthpiece. A rather rare one for the alto clarinet. And when I ordered it, it took six months for it to arrive. Yes. These mouthpieces, as a rule, tend to work better with synthetic reeds. So I have affixed to it a um, uh, Legere Signature Alto Saxon Reed Strength Reed. And I just turned to the dark side again and affixed a silver seed to it. I think it sounds all right. <laughs> And one of the complaints that a lot of band directors will have is, I can't hear the alto clarinet. Can you guys hear that? Yes. Is that loud enough? Matt, can you play louder? <laughs> I think that kind of proves the point. It's loud enough, as long as you can put some air behind it. Now, there are a few different brands out there. We have uh, two of them up here. Now, oddly, the two we have up here are no longer made. Matt and I are both using older Noble instruments, and we have uh, a LeBlanc here. LeBlanc uh, and Noble were basically the same company. Um, you might see some stuff with LeBlanc. LeBlanc Paris has been out of business nearly 10 years. Um, Cost-wise, how much you want to guess I paid for this? Two million. Three thousand. Three thousand. Anyone else? <laughs> Seven thousand. Three thousand. How much you say? Two thousand. Okay. All right. If we take your answer and knock off a zero. Three hundred. Three hundred. That's it. What? Yeah. I got this used, okay, okay. used, mind you, for 300 bucks. 
Take a look on your handout there, and you can see cost breakdown uh, if you want to actually look for a Noblet. Use the layouts of the internet, 300 bucks. Peg installation was about 150. The peg itself is, depending on where you get it from, between 90 and 100 bucks. So you have to have somebody put it on. Then you need to get it repadded, readjusted. That can be another 300 bucks. Or more, depending on what needs to be done. But for 750 bucks, Matt and I both play on the same instrument. Uh, how much did you get yours for? I got mine for uh, 250 on eBay. 250. Yes. Okay. Now here, here's an issue for band directors in the room. You can't buy stuff off of eBay for your band. So you have to go through a bidding process. You have to be able to order from somewhere. We put on this handout all the alto clarinets that are currently made. The most expensive is, of course, a buffet at around a little over $13,000. It should be noted more expensive than their um, bass clarinets, some of them. And there are street models, uh, there are in-between models, but then you can see the price ranges on some of them. If you are a, an individual looking to get into alto clarinet, we do recommend going to use route. Now, one other thing we'd like to talk about is how to compose and how to balance your section. So, being a composer, I like using the alto clarinet. And I'm one of the few composers out there who really likes using it. It's a really interesting voice, particularly for the wind band, because it's a really weak section in the wind band. It's a tenor instrument. In fact, the earliest name for the alto clarinet in English was tenor clarinet. Now, you ever heard it called a tenor clarinet before? A couple people, it's pretty rare. You'll see it in some really old texts, like 1800s. Uh, but it's a tenor instrument. In fact, it has the exact same range as the tenor saxophone, despite having the same transposition as the alto saxophone. Now, because there are people calling for the alto clarinet to go away, the same people should call for the tenor saxophone to go away because it does the same thing. How many of you ever heard of anybody say something bad about tenor saxophone, though? One, two people. Yeah. Because the tenor saxophone is so popular in jazz, with all these great jazz players playing tenor sax, it hasn't gone away. It is not going to go away. So, scoring for the alto clarinet, it's a tenor voice. In fact, there are some people who have advocated that the third clarinet section can just Go away. Just replace them all with alto clarinets. And actually, that's kind of the role it fills. Now, I heard somebody kind of laugh at that. I said, get rid of third clarinets, right? But that's actually from the composer Vincent Persichetti. Uh, Persichetti is one of the great American composers of the 20th century. And he actually advocated, just have yeah, first clarinet, second clarinet, alto clarinets. Done. You don't need any more. Uh, Matt, you want to add anything on that, or we want to go to the balance? Certainly. Uh, I'll make a... Uh, were you going to mention double links? Uh, not yet. All right. Well, using the alto as a third voice perfectly matches the string quartet. The alto clarinet is the viola to the clarinet's violin. If you notice, it takes a little bit of... Um, it's a little bit stronger in the range where the clarinet's weak is the break. <laughs> Those are all the notes that would be thumb F, open G, A, B flat, and C. All much stronger on this particular instrument, controlling for my weird set. Um, do we talk about numbers? I absolutely think we need to go to numbers next. All right, so for those of you who have seen an alto clarinet in a band, how many of you have ever seen more than one? A couple people have seen more than one. Okay. On here is a chart that should correctly balance a clarinet ensemble within a wind band. If you have one first clarinet, one second clarinet, one third clarinet, how many alto clarinets should you have? One. 
And then one base fire. That's really simple. You don't need much more than that. And then you can go down and look at the numbers here. You have four. You still need only just one. But by the time you get to two players per part, in order for it to balance out and match, you probably should have two alto clarinets as well and two bass clarinets. If you have fewer than what you need, <coughs> this voice starts to get drowned out in the band, particularly if you have a lot of brass players. <laughs> yeah, I hear some laughing on that. You guys, how many of you have struggled to be heard over the brass? Uh-huh. Yeah. And if there's not enough numbers, particularly in the lower and middle voices, you aren't going to be heard. Particularly if your band director likes a lot of tubas. Right? And if I may, as an observation, this is related to something you said a little bit more poetically. In reference to our less intelligent friends, the saxophones, if there were 12 alto saxophones and one tenor saxophone, would the tenor saxophone be heard very clearly? Exactly. Thank you, small person. It wouldn't be. <laughs> and if we have 12 B-flat clarinets and one alto clarinet, is the alto clarinet going to be heard? No. No. So you have to have enough numbers to balance out the rest of the section. Otherwise, unless you are as strong a player as Matt is and just blowing your brains out, trying to play as loud as possible. Why am I here? Not a pleasure being of life. That's kind of what the, your alto clarinet player is going to do. And they're going to just... You ever seen that person in the back of the clarinet section just kind of rolling around? Why am I here? And then they play the bad sounds, right? You got to give them something to do, make them feel important. One last thing. Is, and I don't think we've covered this. Who should play the alto clarinet? And Matt, as, as the teacher here, I think you need to address this one. One of the common pitfalls band directors make when they uh, choose to look past their biases and employ the alto clarinet is they'll take the worst clarinetist in the third clarinet section and put them on alto, which is the equivalent of trying to, uh, what's the word, uh, shoot yourself in the foot and run a marathon. There's no point. You're putting a bad, unmotivated player on an instrument that's markedly more difficult than the normal one. What I have seen in my experience, again, using my coach to go right here landing, is that if you put a strong clarinetist on the instrument, they are more readily adept and produce a good sound. Typically, you want to go first chair, second clarinet player is really good, or like last chair, first clarinet player. And I think on that, it is now exactly 3 o'clock. Um, Matt and I are going to stick around if you have any questions later. But there is a recital that's just about to start any minute now over in the main hall. So, like I said, Matt and I will be here if you have questions later. We'd love to field them. But thank you guys so much for coming. I hope you learned something.